literally I am the sorry uh, no worries I am the urban nature organizer with uh, Nature Canada and the lead organizer with the uh, Bird Friendly City program uh, I'll be providing an overview of the Bird Friendly City program and talking a little bit about what got us uh, to you know, developing a program that ultimately aims to address bird biodiversity declines in our cities and towns across the country. Uh, and then I'll be uh, passing it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about the efforts in Calgary that ultimately got the city certified and what's next on the horizon for them. And Kara and Baker will be talking a little bit about their efforts uh, that's undergoing in uh, Saanich. So it's a pretty exciting time. And uh, once again, thank you for having us here. But before we get into the Bird Friendly City program, just a little bit about Nature Canada uh, as an organization, for those who may not know, we are one of the oldest national nature conservation charities in Canada. We were founded in 1939, and since our inception, we've been working with Canadians across the country to protect wildlife species and to conserve their habitats. Uh, in our 80 plus years of existence, we've helped protect over 500,000 square kilometers of parks and wildlife areas, and help countless species from the threat of extinction. Currently on a national level, we represent a network of over 150,000 naturalists and nature lovers and work with more than 1,100 nature groups and conservation organizations in a variety of different programs, Bird Friendly City being one of them, but we also work with uh, uh, in programs such as nature-based climate solutions, protected areas, and reforestation campaigns. Uh, we're also partnered with BirdLife International and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. I'm sure I don't have to go into detail uh, with the folks here about the value of birds. We've got some birders uh, in the crowd today, uh, just hearing about you know, the observations earlier. Uh, but we know there's an intrinsic value to birds. Uh, they are key indicator species to healthy ecosystems. They provide a variety of natural services, including forest regeneration, pollination, pest control and nutrient recycling. Uh, and on top of the natural services, they provide humans with financial and health benefits. We know of uh, ecotourism, uh, bird watching and bird feeding industries that provide a huge boost to local economies. Along with many, uh, a lot of new research talking about how close proximity to nature and wildlife, and more specifically to bird songs, uh, provides a boost to our emotional and mental well-being. Uh, and of course, they're culturally significant in many cultures around the, around the globe. So, like I said, they're intrinsically valuable. But even beyond that, uh, ultimately, the fact is birds are declining at a rapid rate. And two major reports came out in 2019 talking about uh, the bird populations in Canada, as well as uh, on a North American continental scale. First, in the spring of 2019, State of Canada bird came out talking about how majority of the bird populations or the bird groups uh, are undergoing long-term declines. When we look at the bottom of the graph on the right-hand side, uh, aerial insectivores losing about 59% of their population since 1970, grassland birds since uh, 57 since 1970, and shorebirds 40% since 1970, all are major red flags. Um, but ultimately, within that report was also a silver lining, which we really grasped onto. And that was the birds of prey. Uh, as we know, in the 50s and 60s, due to our over-reliance on uh, chemicals such as DDT, raptor populations had you know, declined drastically. But because of proper science-backed management, uh, management practices and collaborative management, really, we were able to rebound their populations to a level that was higher than 1970. And that's really what we grasped onto when we were developing the Bird Friendly City program. This was the second report uh, in 2019 that came out. I'm sure folks here might be aware of this, uh, that we've lost nearly 3 billion birds uh, since 1970 from North American skies. And many of these factors revolve around human action or in some cases, human inaction. When we talk about the loss of habitat due to urban expansion, when we talk about cat predation, when we talk about window collisions or pesticides or insect declines, these are all uh, driven by human activities. And many of the species that at one point that we considered common, and to this point still we consider common, they're undergoing the same drastic declines, uh, indicating that our communities, our cities, our towns are becoming danger zones and have been danger zones for a while. 
with all that knowledge is where the inception of Bird Friendly City really comes. So we started, uh, you know, we got new funding in 2019 from Environment and Climate Change Canada to develop a program to address just that, bird population declines in our urban environments. But the program didn't necessarily come around, you know, overnight. We spent over a year or nearly a year in development. We were having consultations with our partners on a national, regional, local level, uh, conversations with municipal representatives and decision makers, uh, basically with the intention that, A, we want to create a program that addresses and reverses these declines, but at the same time, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to have buy-in from uh, community groups, community organizations, the residents themselves, but also at the same time, the support from decision makers and municipal representatives. And our vision has been to have cities and towns across the country that were safe place for birds, where key threats were effectively mitigated, where nature was restored to a point where native bird populations were thriving, and where residents were involved in celebrating and helping birds and monitoring their populations and community science initiatives. And this is basically that uh, vision in an infographic format. And basically, these are the six steps that we consider are super essential when we you know, envision what a bird-friendly community would be. We want to mitigate the threats. We want to have nature restored. We want the residents involved. We want the local organizations uh, hosting and celebrating birds through events uh, to help build and foster that relationship, that connection to local wildlife, to local birds, to local nature, urban nature, uh, which ultimately leads them to advocate for stronger policies on a municipal level to decision makers. But if I want to, you know, leave one thing with folks here from this infographic, it's the bottom right on your screen, the bird team, the standing committee. These are our on the ground partners that we work with in municipalities across the country um, that are really driving the initiative forward. And, uh, you know, we are supporting them to advance that. As an organization based in Ottawa, national organization, but we're still based in Ottawa, we cannot be actively advocating for stronger municipalities in uh, you know, places and cities and towns across the country. We need champions to stand up and take that stand. And we'd be more than happy to support that, but ultimately it's that on the ground team that's driving the initiative forward. And Sarah, Kara, and Phaedra can speak on that a little bit more later on this presentation. Uh, but going back to the program itself, uh, we developed the criteria, set of criteria that addresses the main threats and concerns that bird populations face within our communities. The criteria is split up into two main uh, sections. The first one being mandatory criteria, which each community, each city, each town needs to uh, meet or, or commit to meeting before they're a bird friendly or to even apply for being a bird friendly city or town. There is about six mandatory criteria, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then you have the optional criteria, which is further split into three different categories. The first category being threat reduction, which basically deals with anything that uh, actively increases bird mortality. That could be your cats, that could be your uh, window collisions, pesticides, um, plastic pollution, etc. The second category deals with habitat protection, restoration, and climate resiliency. Basically, we're looking to uh, protect natural habitat, restore degraded habitat to a point where uh, there's adequate uh, access to food and shelter for bird populations to have a successful breeding cycle, but at the same time to increase a community's resiliency to climate change impacts that are you know, uh, estimated to be coming or are coming in some places already. Uh, and then the third category is community outreach and education, which deals with mobilizing the community, educating the community, building that relationship with local nature that I talked about earlier, and getting them active on an advocacy uh, uh, side of things, asking their decision makers to implement stronger policies. With the optional criteria, though, we're not looking for cities and communities to meet each and every one of these uh, criteria. In an ideal world, of course, that's what we want but understanding that each municipality has their own challenges and has their own capacities, we're looking for cities and towns to meet certain thresholds. And uh, there are three thresholds in the program. Entry level, which is uh, you know, a city and town need, or a town needs to get 50% of uh, points in all three of the categories. Intermediate level bird friendly city, which is 65 to 80%, and a high level, which is over 80% of points in all three categories. 
quick note about the mandatory criteria. We talked about the birth team earlier. Um, we need to have a birth team, a standing committee that is, uh, you know, made up of individuals with diverse set of skills, perspectives, experiences that provide leadership within the community to advance certain initiatives and are flexible uh, with the uh, flexible with the ability to deal with any sort of uh, obstacles or adversity that might arise uh, as their efforts to make their city or town birth friendly. We're looking to get council support as well within that community, a commitment from the municipality itself. Uh, that could come through a motion that is passed in the council, or it could be a letter of support. But ultimately that municipality's uh, support can come up to 12 months after certification has been awarded. We want to see birth teams and local partners uh, partner with the uh, local indigenous communities, uh, whether that's within the municipal boundaries or nearby nations, uh, as they're implementing birth friendly city campaigns within their community. And we want to see uh, them uh, celebrate World Migratory Birth Day. And the main reason for that uh, celebration for World Migratory Birth Day, it's because it's an excellent occasion to uh, celebrate and appreciate birds. Uh, for experienced birders that have been birding for a good part of their lives, or for new folks who are just getting into uh, birding or just becoming aware of bird conservation or you know starting that relationship with uh, nature nearby um, it's a great entry point and to facilitate that we have developed a birthday website where we provide educational resources activities ideas for events that organizations and partners can host uh, to celebrate birds in their own community um, and we uh, uh, help support that through resources as well in uh, 2021, so last year, we had over 55 organizations host events uh, in the midst of a pandemic, so which was a great number across the country. And uh, this year, we're looking to uh, exceed that mark. Um, so, that, you know, we're looking forward to that. For this presentation, I'm not going to go into detail about each and every one of the criteria. We, you know, I mentioned there's 25 of them, but just to give folks an example of what's included or what's involved. Um, some of the big pieces like cats, um, that's one of the main criteria in the threat reduction category. Uh, we deal with cats in three different subcategories. So that's owned cats, that's your pets, that's the ones that you have at your house. Um, unowned cats, uh, feral cat populations, are there any uh, municipal level strategies to reduce the impact that feral cats might have on bird populations? Uh, and then measuring progress. And this is something that you would see, you know, uh, filtered throughout the criteria. We have implemented uh, criteria that deal with measuring progress or monitoring after the fact, because ultimately what we're looking for is to understand the impact of the implementation of these uh, policies or actions over a period of time. We're not looking to set up bird teams or build partnerships with uh, local organizations and municipal officials as a one-off thing. The certification is not the end goal. It is just the launch point to continue protecting bird populations within their community. And we want to actively support that for a long period of time and not just be settled with, oh, okay, you got the certification, hooray. Which is great, get the certification, but understand that it's a long-term commitment. Uh, we have you know, window collisions uh, as well, whether there's guidelines or standards, bird-friendly building design guidelines implemented in your, uh, in your municipality, whether there's council approved biodiversity or habitat protection strategies, uh, within your community? Are there stewardship projects? Stuff like that. And then one of the more popular ones, uh, criteria that uh, we see across the board is the city bird one, where you know our local partners, the bird teams, uh, implement a public engagement process, get the community to vote on pretty much a mascot for their city or town. And ultimately, and I'm sure folks here would agree with this, uh, what better mascot for your city or town to have than a bird? Birds are everywhere. So that gets folks excited. A few benefits, of course, a main benefit, uh, and I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir or preaching to the choir, uh, the main benefit is to protect bird populations. You are addressing the biodiversity declines, you're addressing the bird biodiversity declines. And this is a way to do that. But ultimately it's also a badge of honor. Certification is a badge of honor. Uh, because it tells you know, your neighboring cities, it tells your province, it tells the country, it tells folks on a global scale that you are leading on the efforts to address these declines. Um, it's a source of community pride 
in a you know uh, 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 an environment where we are seeing biodiversity wildlife species disappear and decline at a rate faster than we can help them rebound um your city or town is taking that you know necessary step to address this we have provided a rigorous standard that measures impact and progress of work but at the same time offers flexibility you have an access to a network of other bird teams and i'll show a map later on to just to give you an understanding of how many bird teams are already involved in the program uh, and we talked about the financial benefits and the health benefits earlier on. But ultimately, despite this being a national program, it is a locally driven program. We need champions to stand up and take that effort and make that stand within their community to act as the drivers for this program to you know, move forward, to be the champions of birds. Uh, and ultimately the bird teams or the standing committee, the coalition, whatever you wanna call it, can be anyone that's genuinely interested in making their community bird friendly. It could include naturalists or birders that are, you know, within the audience themselves, uh, environmental groups, municipal representatives, uh, local businesses, uh, school groups, educational institutions, uh, student groups, youth groups, book clubs, library clubs. We've seen all of this uh, involved in the different bird teams across the country uh, and individual residents. Some of our bird teams are chaired and led by individual residents that are not officially affiliated with any organization. And they're doing a tremendous job as well. So it ultimately just depends on the passion that you have and the understanding that it takes folks within that community to take that stand. And ultimately on our end, uh, we would be providing resources. We would be providing, uh, we provide the structured template, which is the criteria, small grants. Uh, we offer small grants to uh, bird teams to help uh, move their initiatives forward. A collaboration on funding applications, uh, developing strategies to implement actions or engaging municipal officials or engaging the local media, national media, whatever the case may be. Um, this was the map that I was referring to. Uh, you have about 35 to 37 bird teams currently in place in uh, Canada. Uh, the magenta burgundy-ish color, um, it represents the cities that are already certified and announced. And there are four cities, but because there are quite a few bird teams with the blue dots um, in place, some of them are hidden. So you have uh, uh, cities like Toronto, uh, Vancouver, London, and Calgary certified already. And they were certified back in May of 2021. And ultimately we're looking to certify a, a total of uh, at least 30 cities and towns um, by this year's birthday, which is May 14th, uh, 2022. I'll pause here now and I'll, uh, you know, pass it over to Sarah to speak a little bit about uh, the efforts that are happening or and have happened in Calgary over the last 18 months or so. Thanks, Ali. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to tell you about what we've been doing in Calgary. Um, so the Bird Friendly Calgary team, I'll just tell you a little bit, little bit about who we are and what we did. Um, so we first got together in October of 2020. And we are a group of about 14 of us that are kind of the main core members at this point from several nonprofit environmental organizations in the city, as well as citizens that are just interested in birds and biodiversity. Um, we have members from Nature Calgary. So we have the president of Nature Calgary. Um, we have people from the Calgary Migratory Species Response Team, which is a volunteer organization focused on um, mitigating window strikes in the city. It, particularly in downtown Calgary for now, but uh, we'll be moving into the city as we can. Um, also the Royal Astronomical Society, we do have a member from there. Um, he's really interested in light pollution, so he came to us with that in mind. Um, we also have members from the city of Calgary, and we do also have indigenous representation from uh, the Guyanai First Nation, which is just south of Calgary. Um, well, a little bit two hours south of Calgary but uh, yeah Alvin First Rider is is with us as well and gives us our Indigenous consultation um, whenever he can and then there's people like myself um, I mean I'm, I'm on the Calgary Migratory Species Response Team but I came as just a, a citizen who cares about biodiversity and I just really wanted to try and see if we could a get Calgary certified and then also how can we make Calgary a city that is friendlier to birds because as Ali said it doesn't stop just with the certification we have so much opportunity to go beyond that so that's where I came uh, from 
And we do also have members who, who, like Ali said, have no affiliation with any other organization other than they have an interest in birds and they just wanted to be a part of, of what we have. So we have a pretty um, diverse group of people on our team and we all come with very diverse views, but uh, we certainly can agree that we're all in it for um, helping make Calgary a more friendly city for birds. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about our certification. One of the biggest parts of getting certified was creating a partnership with the city. So we had, at the time, we had two members on the city's biodiversity. So you can see there our, our fun little word, word play we did, biodiversity advisory council. Um, that is actually a city of Calgary advisory council, um, which I am now a member of. I was not at the time that we got certified, but I am now. Um, but we do, do did have two members at the time who could connect us with city staff. And creating that partnership with the city was very important just alone to collect what is in place in the city in terms of policies and guidelines without even thinking about how we needed to have the official support of the city or that motion or letter of support from the mayor. Just having them help us track down everything that was going on in the city because there's actually a lot, um, we never would have found it without that. So we did have city park staff that were supporting our efforts, um, helping us track down those relevant policies and also kind of guiding us where we could look if the city does not have something in place. And they also um, got us connected with the city council. So we did have um, a counselor who championed our, our cause and brought it to, um, at the time, Mayor Nenshi. And he was very happy to sign a letter of support for us and uh, help us with moving forward in our certification. Once we got our certification, the city staff actually stepped back. Um, but again, there are two of us Biodiversity Advisory Council members that are still involved. And so anything that comes through the bird team that needs to get to the city can go through the Biodiversity Advisory Council. So there is still that connection, even if it's not directly with park staff. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the, challenge, the challenges that we had. So it's important to recognize it's not going to be an easy, you know, smooth sailing process necessarily. There is a lot of information to gather and you may have some other constraints as well. Um, some of the challenges that we saw, we had a pretty tight timeline. So we got together in November of 2020. Is that right? November, did I say 2020? Yes, 2020. And uh, you know, we wanted to get that certification for May. We really decided as a team that we would like to be one of the first cities certified in May of 2021, which meant that we had to get everything together, which we didn't actually start doing until January and to submit by April. So we gave ourselves a pretty tight timeline, which created a bit of, um, bit of work at the front end, but doable. We, we did manage to track everything down. Um, also, another challenge that we had was needing council support, but there was also an election, a municipal election last year, and there came um, a time when the city was no longer allowed to endorse anything, so we had to get in there before that time, so we had to get to the mayor, even though he wasn't running for re-election, he still was not allowed to endorse anything after a certain period, so we had to get to him before that to get his letter of support. Um, Thankfully, we did have that connection with another counselor also who didn't run again, but still was not allowed to endorse us after a certain time. But we found it and uh, yeah, we, we overcame that hurdle. And also finding all of the policies and documents was a bit of a challenge because again, there is a lot to potentially go through. But where the city did have something, didn't have something, that should say didn't have something, um, we knew a nonprofit organization might have something. So the city gave us what they had. And then from that, we could kind of outsource and look for potential areas that might have something going as well. So for instance, in the case of cats, um, with unowned cats, in terms of feral cats, the city of Calgary does not have an official program going for feral cats. So we kind of outsourced to other nonprofits. And we did find that the Meow Foundation has a um, feral cat colony spay neuter release program and so we were able to collaborate with them to get all of the de details on that and we still stay in touch with them for um, those numbers and, and what they're doing with that. So it's a it's a real collaboration even beyond our team with other nonprofits that we've developed. Next slide please. 
So once we did get our certification, um, we were able to use funding from Nature Canada to hold a uh, Indigenous speaker series through the public library. Um, we were pretty excited. We actually invited um, Bradford Kasberg, who actually works with the Audubon Society. He's from the Miami tribe in Oklahoma. And he was able to talk with us about um, saving birds the traditional way. So bringing that Indigenous perspective and the traditional eco ecological knowledge of Indigenous people to um, conservation, in particular when it comes to birds. So shifting that perspective away from maybe an individual bird conservation into the bigger landscape picture and those interconnections and looking at it in a much different way. So he brought kind of a very broad um, traditional perspective for us. And then after that, uh, we brought in two local speakers from the Guy and I First Nation um, who talked about bison and birds. So recently down in Southern Alberta, they have reintroduced bison to the traditional lands of the Guy and I and um, Bagani people. So with that reintroduction, they talked about the importance of what the bison do for the land. So everything from how they can transport seeds to different places that can grow into plants that can support the insects that the birds need. And also those traditional um, relationships with such as like the bison and magpies where magpies traditionally would go around with the bison and pick ticks off of them. That relationship got lost as soon as the bison disappeared, but now there's that opportunity to bring that back. And so what was lost can be brought back. It was a pretty neat, optimistic um, talk and really inspired us all to look at it from a conservation perspective of interconnectedness again, and nothing is on its own and doing one action can help save other things as well. So it was a really, really great opportunity. And we've actually used that opportunity to move forward again this year um, with getting indigenous speakers again for our city bird contest, which I'll talk about in a second here. So as we're moving forward, uh, next slide, please, Ellie. So as we're moving forward, um, we have now gone from our full team, we've broken up into groups to kind of target those areas where we could strengthen our, our policies or our actions in the city. So Calgary actually did get entry level certification simply based on we did really well on our community outreach, really good on our habitat protection, little bit low on the threat reduction. So we're kind of focusing our efforts on the threat reduction category um, and looking at what we can do to improve the city in that perspective, but also um, looking at all the other categories as well. So we are looking at, um, even though we have strong cat policies um, in the city, whether or not they're enforced is another question. So I'm really excited about this one. Um, we got a grant from Nature Canada this year and we just came in the mail today. I got two GPS collars and we are going to get some cats in the city, put them on there and GPS track them and map them out so that people can actually see where these cats are roaming. And not just from a perspective of birds, but also from the danger that it, it is for cats. Um, everybody on our team, I think, I think everybody on our team is, is a cat owner and we all love cats. And I mean, I've got two and I, I'm concerned about if my cats get out, where are they going? Are they crossing major roads that are nearby? Are they going to interact with another cat, with a dog, with, a, with wildlife? What's gonna happen? So we're going to try and collar a few cats in the city and see what we can find and hopefully use that for messaging with um, the city to kind of encourage people to understand that when you let your cat out, there's a lot of danger for them, let alone for, for other animals. Um, there is also an ongoing with the Calgary Migratory Species Response Team. In the fall, we put out um, 15 cameras in backyards to, again, um, see if we can catch roaming cats and see if we could also maybe see if they're catching birds. Um, and we're going to do that again in April. So we're doing two sessions, 15 cameras in backyards. Um, first round, we, we didn't catch anybody really during the day. It was mostly at night, which was kind of interesting. So I'm interested to see in April when birds are returning from migration, what that what that's going to look like. Um, so the other, yeah, the, the GPS is, it's really exciting. I'm super excited about this. Um, so we're also working on our official bird contest, which is another really exciting um, thing for us. It's, it is, I think, the most fun that we are having. 
And um, just today, I got a notice of motion from a city councillor. So we have a councillor who is super excited as well. And we now have the city of Calgary on board. And they're going to be helping us um, promote it and holding the voting on the city of Calgary website. So we now have it narrowed down to five species. But how we did that, um, we actually engaged with local birding groups and nature groups in the city and all of the um, First Nations in and around the city of Calgary to ask them for nominations. Uh, we got 41 species were nominated. And from that, we took the top five species, which we will be bringing forward to Calg Calgarians in April to May with um, the hope that we can announce it on, again, World Migratory Bird Day on May 14th. So our five species, just so you know what they're, what's coming, uh, we have the black cap chickadee, the black-billed magpie, uh, northern flicker, red-breasted nuthatch, and the blue jay. So those are our top five choices. They all happen to be um, year-round residents in Calgary, so that's kind of fun. Um, we were kind of surprised, no raptors of any sort made the cut, but that's just how it goes. And within our team, um, we're actually kind of having a lot of fun because there's there's some lighthearted competition amongst team members. We may have Team Chickadee and Team Magpie, and then some Team Flickers over there as well. But uh, <laughs> we have uh, some lighthearted fun with it. And so, as we're bringing that to the city, we're going to be making um, short videos for all five species, which we've got um, one of our local universities, the students, the film students are actually gonna put those together for us. And again, we've used some grant money from Nature Canada to do this. And we are bringing the indigenous perspective as well um, with our, we're hoping to get traditional knowledge on all five species. And if not traditional knowledge, at least um, something something that we can, can find that connects um, connects the Indigenous traditional knowledge some way with these birds, even if it is just the ecosystem that they historically were on. So that's where we're going. Um, we do also have our window strike um, work ongoing and that's gonna keep going. And that's kind of one of the ones where we, we can use some stronger guidelines. There are um, window guidelines for the city, but we would like to actually create those into a bylaw so that they actually have to be enforced because right now we're finding it's not really, it's there, but nobody really has to follow it. So we wanna bring that forth. And same with light pollution is, is simply just making people aware. So using that as an educational um, opportunity for us because most people don't actually realize that birds migrate at night and leaving your lights on creates that hazard. And a lot of these birds are colliding with windows simply because the light, light pollution is confusing them. Um, so we're gonna use that as an educational opportunity going forward. And another, um, I'm gonna be speaking with somebody from Nature Canada, Erin, um, on Friday about the 2 billion trees program that the federal government has uh, coming forward. And we are gonna look at how we can implement that in Calgary. So we have lots of fun stuff going and, and I'm really excited for, for what comes next. So, I mean, the certification is, really just the beginning. And once you have that certification, the sky's the limit on, on where you can go with all of these categories and, and what you can do. And I think that's it from me. <laughs> yeah, um, and that was exactly a great point to make. You know, certification is the beginning. And that's exactly what we're looking for when we're establishing bird teams and working with partners. Um, there we go. I think now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Kara and Phaedra to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Saanich. Take it away. Great, it looks like it's, it's having a little moment, but I think we'll get there. Should be my title slide. Do people see my title slide? Excellent. Yeah, so um, myself and Phaedra will be presenting and uh, we got a beautiful introduction from Anne Nightingale at the beginning. Thank you, Anne. So I'll just dive right in. Um, but not that way, this way. All right. Um, so I just want to center people in the vision and mission of the Nature Sanctuary, Swan Lake Christmas Hill Nature Sanctuary. Um, and we are really looking to foster community appreciation and respect and uh, conserve and really bring about that active stewardship in the folks that come on site and so um, 
folks here in Victoria may have seen in our backyard, the Saanich uh, publication that we just talked about, our adopt a patch program that we're having. So it's a, an opportunity for people to come on site and learn those hands-on site-based ecosystem restoration skills. Um, and, and then most folks here in Victoria know that uh, the nature sanctuary is 160 acres, but I thought I would just like, again, center us in the overall footprint of the site. So we have a rare contiguous Gary Oak ecosystem. And then there's a corridor that connects along Melthorpe to the wetland around Swan Lake. So we have two really distinct ecosystems that we're looking at with different biodiversity at each of the, the spots. And so we have some different challenges in, in the, each of the different areas. And it's important for people to be thinking about both and, and connecting these ideas to the larger sort of systems thinking. And so um, here's a map from 1997 in red and then from 1800 in green of Gary Oak habitat. And Gary Oak ecosystems have some of the highest biodiversity in Canada. And they are also some of the most rapidly encroached upon habitat in Canada due to urbanization and other human development. And so uh, because of this, this region on Eastern Vancouver Island is considered a crisis ecoregion. And so I'm giving some of this background to, to sort of like lay the foundation for why it's important for us to participate in initiatives like the Bird Friendly City, because some of this kind of information can be a little bit too conceptual for people and they, they can't really get engaged until they get excited about a bird and they're really following a bird and its, and its ha habitat and then thinking about, oh my gosh, like this habitat has been really restricted and it's important to think about. And then another piece with respect to the uh, wetlands, this is the uh, Capital Regional District map, the Colquitt's River watershed. And you can see that uh, at about a little over a decade ago, 24% of this area is impervious surface. So this water lands on pavement and just flows around and has to be managed. And when you um, look again at this map, you can see that, oh, Swan Lake is a really critical part of this uh, riparian or seasonal wetland here. And the other major part is around Rithitz Bog. And so folks from, from Victoria know that Swan Lake represents a really important, beautiful habitat for all kinds of uh, wetland birds. And it's also really critical habitat on the migratory uh, bird pathway and a Pacific flyway. So I've got this little video from eBird, which if you haven't checked these out, there's individual species videos showing the uh, relative abundance of the birds over time. And, and so they're kind of amazing. I'll just play that one more time. So you can see that where we are on the Southeastern Vancouver Island is really critical for the olive-sided flycatcher, which is a, a near threatened bird species. And, and so again, this is an opportunity to, to sort of elevate the conversation around how something like, oh, it's just Swan Lake or it's just Christmas Hill. Because they're in the urban envelope, people kind of think of like, ho-hum, it's my backyard, but these are really special habitats that we need to be having these conversations about. Um, and in addition to applying to become a bird-friendly city, we're also looking at becoming a key biodiversity area through Wildlife Conservation Society Canada and then also looking at uh, becoming a migratory bird sanctuary through Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, so with respect specifically to the Bird Friendly City Initiative, uh, we were very lucky, I didn't realize, um, Sarah, when you were speaking, that um, we got our uh, motion approved at council on February 7th and uh, people were just like happy and excited. It, it wasn't so hard. Um, and so I didn't realize that I should be so delighted. Um, but yeah, last spring we had many meetings through the Greater Victoria Naturehoods and um, I, Ali, I think you participated in some of those and uh, Umer who uh, predated, um, I think you, uh, we talked about that each municipality within uh, the Capital Regional District would, would independently apply for certification. And so I've included this map of all of the different districts and the populations from 2011, 2016, and then 2021. And, and what you can see from this map is that Sandwich is one of the largest or is the largest by population, definitely. Um, 
and and has grown by three percent. And I know that there was an article recently in the Times columnist talking about Langford growing by thirty two percent. And I think it would be really wonderful for Langford to move forward and become a bird friendly city as well. Um, and also, I include this map for folks who are not from Victoria because this is definitely puzzling, right? To if you're from the greater Toronto area, you're like, wait, so how many people? And they have their own mayor, and what's happening? Um, but what's exciting about splitting it up this way is that we have the, the capacity in this area to do really locally adapted projects and we'll have a greater variety of, of focal projects can be focused on different things. And so I've put 13 times the fun. And I did wanna give a shout out to our partners at Saanich. So Eva Rikias, who's the senior manager of parks there has been just wonderful to work with and is very excited about this initiative. And then Nature Canada has been very helpful, not only with the Bird Friendly City uh, small grant, but then also the wage subsidy through the Work to Grow program, which supports Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And so this is a really key component too, is diversifying the voices that we see moving forward in nature advocacy. And so it's just truly exceptional how Nature Canada is leading this initiative and providing all kinds of not only great resources on their website and, and frameworks, but also funding support. So I uh, encourage any of the other folks on the call tonight that might be from a different municipality who would like to participate to reach out and ask us uh, some more questions about that if they're interested. So I'll pass it over to Phaedra with that. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Phaedra. I've been working as a community education assistant at the Nature Sanctuary for the past little while. and. Um, I've been working on the Bird Friendly City Initiative for the past few months, and so I'll talk a little bit about how that work's been going, because as Kara mentioned, we got our motion passed, um, and we're still in the process of gathering all the evidence um, for certification, so it'll be a little bit different than from Sarah's perspective with the certification already done. Um, but I wanted to briefly just um, start off with like how I came to birding in this initiative, um, because I'm a fairly new bird enthusiast, but I love the world. Um, and it all kind of started with like mandatory eBird checklist for a course that I was taking. Um, and it just, we had an experience of like going out in the field and I loved it. Um, but just the fact of, I went to this park, um, High Park in Toronto, um, and I'd been there before and we were birding at this pond. Um, again, I'd been there before, but I just saw like wood ducks for the first time. And it was just really like emphasizes that bird blindness is real and most people don't see it. And once you kind of lift that veil, I think that it can really change your perspective and like really enhance that connection to nature around you um, and can really get people engaged. And so um, at that point, I didn't even have binoculars. So this bird, I put this one on the screen. It's a Blackburnian warbler um, because that's the bird I saw and um, just walking home to my apartment one day. And it inspired me to get binoculars because I had so much fun like Googling, trying to figure out what it was. And it was gorgeous colors. Um, and so when I started at Swan Lake in the fall, um, there was like an opportunity for me to work on whichever project. Um, and lucky for me, Kara noticed that I'd written, I like birding. So she mentioned this project, the Bird Friendly City Initiative that she'd started with um, District of Saanich. And yeah, so I just, yeah, I wanted to ground in the fact that I, I'm talking to birders, so I know you guys understand, but just the fact that birding is such an amazing community, um, but also it's just such a good way for people to really um, kind of foster that stewardship mindset because you you can see them they're everywhere and once you notice them there's so much you know to enjoy and appreciate um, but yeah so I'm gonna move to the next slide and talk a little bit more about the certification application process uh, so like Ali was mentioning early on there's a lot of um, criteria so there's 25 criteria and all these different categories um, so it can be a lot you got to look for all the evidence for everything so I started with creating a spreadsheet because I like spreadsheets um, and color coding it and labeling it just to keep track of everything um, and just help visualize, you know, where we are, where we're going. Um, and so for, it also, I did this in Google Sheets, which was really helpful um, because you can easily collaborate with others and it's always up to date and, you know, like leave notes for each other and, um, right. oh, sorry, <laughs> I pressed the wrong thing. <laughs> sorry. There um, but yeah, so the spreadsheet was really helpful of keeping track of everything. And then 
with all the criteria, there is a lot of information, like a lot of researching that needs to be done um, and looking at documents. And so I really um, did control F a lot, which allows you to search a document or web page for keywords and really cuts down the time. Um, but also like sometimes a bylaw will just have like numbers in the name and not be super intuitive and you're looking for really niche information. Uh, so it's just helpful to know if you're on the right track or not as well. Um, and then I, uh, Sarah mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that where your government might, your municipal government might not have you know, meet a criteria, a nonprofit might. And we found that as well. And I just wanted to mention that with that, like, like I said, the birding and kind of conservation community as a whole is super passionate and committed and they have been so helpful. You know, if you reach out, everyone is really happy to help and pushing these kinds of initiatives forward. So that support is there, even though it might seem a little daunting with all the criteria. Um, and same with Nature Canada, they've been super helpful and supportive throughout this whole process. So it seems daunting, but it's also very doable, as Sarah mentioned as well. Um, and then we, while going through the criteria, we're also looking for gaps um, that we just don't have in the district um, and then how we can fill them. So that's kind of been the second part of what I've been doing at the Nature Sanctuary. So we'll switch the slide. And um, that's been looking like creating an exhibit for our nature house. So we have four windows in our library. Um, and the idea is we're gonna be making a whole display about um, bird strikes and abatement and how we can prevent them and just kind of educating the public on the fact that this is a major problem birds are facing um, and there's actually easy you know solutions and a re really good ways to prevent it and it doesn't have to be super expensive you don't have to remodel your whole, whole house you can just put these treatments on your windows so I started with um, an oil-based pen painting um, and that was really fun. I got a strap in on the scaffolding. Um, and I chose to do a bunch of different bird species because I like birds, but also because I kind of wanted to draw attention to the fact that while, you know, we know that migratory birds may be more probable of hitting windows, um, all birds are actually susceptible um, to window strikes. And even some of those larger, like charismatic birds that people love, like owls or hawks, um, can also fall victim. And there are these easy solutions that we can implement. Um, and so that's the first one, that one is already up, but we will be adding a bird screen, um, paracord, which is also known as uh, bird savers, um, and feather friendly dots. And again, the idea is to have it all DIY um, and just low cost so people can be encouraged that it doesn't have to be a big thing, um, but it can be fun and affordable and um, and then also the educational component will be a lot about kind of busting myths. Um, people might think about window collisions like, yeah, all birds are, sus are susceptible. And also, you know, some people think it's only high rises, but actually the majority of collisions happen in the first one to four stories. Um, and so just kind of getting people involved in that and um, aware. And so next slide. Um, and then the second piece for kind of education has been doing social media. Um, and so when we were starting this project, kind of thinking about what topics we wanted to cover leading up to cert certification, but also our um, exhibit and different educational posts promoting different events. And so recently this past weekend, um, I'm sure you all know it was the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, and so we did some promotion for that um, on our social media and it was really fun. I got to collaborate with a local photographer, Bruce Tuck, um, and we created these checklists of 18 total um, species that are can be spotted at the nature sanctuary this time of year um, with the idea to kind of help folks who are maybe not as familiar um, with the bird and bird, bird identification. Um, and it's good too, because it's even beyond this event, we're able to like hand this out to visitors and hopefully garner that connection with birds and our space on site as well. Um, and then going forward, we have some more um, plans for other educational posts about like what is bird friendly city, how people can get involved, um, more stuff about window collisions, why birds are so important, as Ellie mentioned earlier, and we all know, but just some people aren't aware and just, you know, engaging people however we can. And again, with all the species, because I think it's so fun once you learn a species and you spot it everywhere. 
um, it's a really fun way to connect with nature. And yeah, so that's kind of what I've been doing so far on this project and where we're at um, in Saanich and the Nature Sanctuary. So I'll pass it back to Kara to finish off. Yeah, and I just wanted to finish with this last slide, thinking about World Migratory Bird Day that's coming up. And the theme for this year is a focus on light pollution. And um, as folks probably here are aware that light pollution is just increasing year over year. And then locally, uh, it, it's important to engage on this issue currently because the Capital Regional District is looking at um, widening and lighting the Lockside Trail, which is a bike path that travels along the south side of the nature sanctuary. And I was fortunate enough to walk last week with uh, Colin Plant, the chair of the CRD board. And uh, he was unaware that uh, light pollution was an issue. So just like uh, Sarah, you were saying that, that people often aren't connecting to when birds are traveling. And so, yeah, so we're really hoping to get uh, our, our, all our ducks in a row for the uh, World Migratory Bird Day so that we can get our application in and, and be certified and celebrate that and raise awareness and, and hopefully uh, convince folks here locally that uh, lighting that trail that way might not be the best, best choice. So with that, I will pass it over to Ali, but encourage folks to reach out to us if they have any questions and definitely to follow us on social media on the channels and, and, and watch the campaign as it unfolds. Uh, thank you uh, to all three for, you know, that was uh, amazing. And I just have to say, Phaedra, you're an amazing artist. Uh, that was very impressive. Um, but anyway, just to wrap things up, I wanted to share a few examples of uh, some of the stuff that bird teams have been doing across the country. Across the country. Um, uh, this was a news article from London uh, in summer of 2021 when they went through their own city bird poll. Um, and ultimately got 6,000, over 6,000 individuals, residents from uh, the city of London to end up selecting Northern Cardinal as their city bird. Um, and something cool that they did, uh, Sarah, this might be of interest to the Bird Friendly Calgary team. Um, they ultimately partnered with the local brewery and released Northern Cardin Ale. And that sold out in the first two days. So it, there's a lot of opportunities and I kind of, you know, just to kind of bring it back to the fact that you can go anywhere you want with this program. Um, the sky is the limit. Sorry, you said it best. And ultimately, it really just depends on how determined, how motivated the local partners are, because we as Nature Canada, we're willing to go to the limits to help support the local teams to advance uh, bird conservation and uh, uh, efforts to protect bird populations within their community. Uh, this is a bit more recent. Uh, this is happening in Hamilton and Burlington uh, from this February, a couple of articles. Uh, the bird team in Hamilton and Burlington are also currently undergoing their own uh, city bird poll. Uh, so just for context, there's one bird team working on two cities, Hamilton and Burlington, uh, and uh, they're trying to identify uh, city birds for both cities. And their poll ends March 16th. So this is something that's exciting as well, and they're looking forward to forward to announcing, uh, you know, which is ultimately going to be the mascots, the city birds for both cities. Uh, a news article, or I guess a post from uh, our partners in Guelph, similar to what Phaedra was doing at the sanctuary, uh, the bird team in Guelph hired or contracted a uh, local artist uh, in Guelph to draw onto the windows at the city hall, pretty much to raise awareness locally in Guelph uh, about the impacts of uh, bird window collisions and just how simple and easy it could be to sort of mitigate that, uh, 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 the, you know, the bird mortality that comes from uh, window collisions. We know around 25 million birds annually die uh, after colliding from windows uh, each year in Canada. So a little bit uh, could go a long way in helping protect some of these birds. Uh, examples of a few uh, sites that uh, our bird teams have launched to basically interact with and engage their local residents to raise awareness to, about the program, to share knowledge. A lot of cool stuff is happening. And I'd suggest, you know, folks to go check out these websites as well as, you know, uh, Swan Lakes uh, uh, website, social media for Bird Friendly Calgary to learn about 
uh, and get really entrenched in what folks are doing because there's good information regardless whether you're in that city or not. A um, few social media posts, the mayors of Toronto and Vancouver making videos. I know uh, the mayor of uh, Calgary uh, at that time uh, also made a video celebrating uh, the certification. So there, it could be a lot of uh, collaboration going and it. it. It gets folks excited when there is uh, participation, both from the community as well as the municipality uh, coming together for this initiative because it ultimately is a very important thing uh, to protect biodiversity and protect birds. So. How can folks here get involved? Um, you know, a lot of good things were shared, uh, both by, uh, by all three, Kara, Phaedra, and Sarah. Uh, but ultimately, and I feel like I'm speaking to the right audience here, if you are a birder, if you have some relationship to birds, if you're interested in protecting birds, be that champion. You know, raise your hand uh, and make that stand. Um, we are more than happy to help work through whatever limitation capacities you as an individual organization might be facing. Ultimately, we want to establish bird teams in every municipality across the country. We want to see bird-friendly cities and towns across the country. Each and every city or town should be bird-friendly, in our opinion. So that's what we would like uh, to see the audience here. Maybe we can get a few folks raising their hand. Um, there's also processes on the website that you can fill out. There's a questionnaire that you can fill out to kind of uh, you know, let us know to, to get in touch with you and we can start the conversation process, start identifying what the priorities and the gaps might be within your community. You also have a great example right there with Swan, uh, Swan Lake and Christmas Hill Nature Sanctuary um, and tapping in with them and getting their expertise and experiences about how they got things rolling in Sandwich. So, you know, that's what I would want to leave things off with. Um, ultimately, the power, so to speak, not to be too cheesy, but it is around close to midnight in uh, Gatineau, but uh, it is within yourselves uh, to, you know, take that stand and, uh, you know, partner with us as we try to protect bird biodiversity across the country. So, um, quick note of partners, uh, Feather Friendly, Quebec Oiseau, Flap Canada, all involved nationally on the Bird Friendly City Program. And of course, this program could not have existed without the funding from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Galston Foundation, Margaret Atwood, and the McLean Foundation. And now, finally, I'll leave it there. So if there's any questions, comments, concerns, I'm sure all four of us are extremely happy to answer them, uh, but I'll stop sharing my slide now. Well, thank you so much, Ali, Kara, Sarah, and Vedra. That was a, an amazing presentation. And I know there's gonna be questions, so I wanna get a question, actually a statement in with a question first. Inter a World Migratory Bird Day. Rocky Point Bird Observatory has been hosting World Migratory Bird Day for the capital region for more than 10 years now. Does each municipality have to have a wor World Migratory Bird Day or does the one that we currently have give everybody, every municipality one point <laughs> towards their bird friendly city certification? Um. That would depend on, I guess, what we are trying to do is see the impact uh, on the community uh, when we're celebrating these events. So uh, we would definitely encourage if you know anyone from any of the other 13 municipalities was applying to add that. But what we would want to see is local uh, neighborhoods get involved, going on a hike, learning about birds, seeing that, like Phaedra uh, uh, mentioned, that initial you know awe of like building that connection and then constantly having that reinforced every time you see that same bird. We want to see that established within the communities, within the residents. So ideally we would want to see, you know, local events, um, but I would definitely have to look into how that Rocky Point uh, event is uh, yeah. taking well, place. The good news for Phaedra and Kara is that it's, it's held in Saanich. So uh, you guys already have a, a World Migratory Bird Day happening in Saanich. It'll be at uh, Elk Beaver Lake Park, uh, Beaver Lake Park. Uh, RPBO also has, this will be our second World Migratory Bird Week that we're putting on, or sorry, Victoria Bird Week that butts up right against uh, Migratory Bird Day. So there are some events that will be already happening. And so you might wanna connect with RPBO to see what's going on there. Uh, okay. So, oh, we, we did participate last year. We made uh, yes. coloring sheets with yeah. migratory birds. Yeah. Right. And I, I, if you haven't been contacted yet by Julie, you can expect to shortly. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so now I will open that up. There's some questions in the chat room. Uh, and so you can decide which of the four of you is best to answer these. Uh, are you working with Saanich and the City of Victoria planners regarding bird-friendly buildings and glass standards? The, certainly one of the reasons that uh, a lot of people are paying attention right now is the are the concerns about the proposed TELUS building in downtown Victoria. Any comments on that? Yeah, uh, hope folks don't feel like I'm jumping ahead there. Yeah, Ali, if you want, yeah, okay. Um, so Councillor Loveday uh, through City of Victoria had reached out and was concerned about that uh, in the fall. And, um, you know, as, as you saw Sarah talk about and Ali and, and also Phaedra, the, the way that the certification process works is it's a variety of different standards and uh, themes that you speak on. And so um, I see, and this also speaks to this next question about dogs off leash and whatnot. And, and so the notion is that not any one of the things is going to be perfect. It's that you're working toward, like you certify and then you're just ever sort of ameliorating your approach and raising awareness about these issues. So um, I, I, there was, when we brought this to council in Saanich, folks here probably are aware that there's, uh, you know, people are quite upset about feral cats. And, and, and so they're like, well, you can't, you can't say you're bird friendly if there are any cats roaming around Saanich. Well, we can be entry level bird friendly, and then we can ever work to improve that. And so so we don't we don't want to let the perfect defeat the good, right? We we want to just sort of continually look for growing our awareness and, and improving and and uh, yeah, and also it's just that you know we catch more flies with honey, right? So that sort of approach to is making it approachable and just sort of ever including more people in in this awareness. So definitely the the Telus Glass Building. There's a the Greater Victoria Naturehood has written about this directly to folks and. Um, there's been a, a lot of, um, of communication about that. And then, yeah, the dogs, you know, we could talk about the dogs all night, right? So I know that, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging topic and it's very polarized. And, but again, we just, we don't wanna not love dogs. We want to love dogs in the appropriate spots and we wanna love nature in the appropriate spots and we wanna just grow that awareness. And if I could just add in, just uh, to your point, Kara, about not letting the perfect defeat the good. Um, there is over 35 bird teams, and I'm pretty sure I can guarantee it almost. Not, no one city is going to get perfect scores. Um, the idea is not to work to the point and continue pushing, pushing, pushing until you get perfect. There's always going to be some challenges. There's always going to be some policies, some actions taken that ultimately... Uh, we looking at it from outside in and, you know, folks on the ground will look at it as like, okay, that's not very bird friendly. The effort or the thought process is you want to continuously work towards that. It is not something that, you know, you will achieve. It's like a lot of things when we talk about, you know, it's a work in progress and it has to remain a work in progress. It has to be consistent over a period of time. It cannot be a one and done thing. So, yeah, any city, any town that has been, you know, certified and announced already that hasn't been announced, but has been certified, um, no one's getting a perfect mark. And the intention is that no one gets a perfect mark because we want to see that continuous build over a period of time uh, within these cities. So I saw Jacques' camera come on. And so I'm wondering, Jacques, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, this talk. Uh, Ali, a question for you. Who, so you said we have about 30 bird friendly cities in Canada. Is that what you said? No, uh, there's about 37 bird teams. So there are 37 cities uh, or towns working towards achieving bird friendly cities. And how many uh, are bird friendly cities at this currently, point? Currently, there are four bird friendly cities that have been announced, Calgary being one of them. Uh, Toronto, Vancouver, and London, and there's about five more announcements that will be coming over the next period of time. Okay, and so we have four bird-friendly cities. I'm just mm -hmm. curious, which one is the most friendly to birds in all these four? Take a guess. I from your, Toronto, from your Vancouver, perch here. London, and Calgary. Take a guess. <laughs> Calgary, London. I guess. No. Uh, no, uh, it, it was not uh, Calgary. London. It was London. Yeah. London, I think right? I'm yeah, I heard someone say London, yeah. 
Um, London got the highest marks, uh, the highest score, ultimately did not get perfect, but both Toronto and London received a high level for friendly city certification. So, so this is where the conversation is the most advanced at this point in Toronto and London, I guess. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question? You can unmute yourself and uh, turn on your camera if you like uh, and ask your question. Or you can write it in the chat. Or if you wake up at 3 a.m., you're welcome to email us. And we'll <laughs> answer on a different day. OK, I'm really shocked by a lack of questions here. Uh, so I'm going to ask you some more. <laughs> OK, let's say there's someone in this room who, who wants to know what they can do personally. You've excited them with the, with the chat here. And they, they would like to maybe take on um, a, a key role in moving their municipality forward towards becoming bird friendly. What's the next step for them? I can take this on and then folks here can also jump in. Um, what we would you know ask folks to do, if you're interested, if you're even just curious about seeing if this would be a good fit uh, within your municipality, reach out to us. Uh, what we do is we have these one-on-one uh, -on -one or, you know, intake conversations, uh, discussing the program and getting the perspective of the local residents on what the appetite is within that community. And obviously, from what Kara, Phaedra, and Sarah have spoken about, um, the appetite is there for folks wanting to do more. It's a question about where to jump in at. And we can help support folks by identifying other individuals, by connecting with um, you know, maybe different community organizations that may be in place um, within that uh, community and start building on what we call a baseline, which is what Phaedra talked about with the uh, Excel file. And that really gives us an inventory of what, you know, community X might be uh, currently doing and then identify the gaps and working towards implementing those gaps or filling those gaps. So first step, if you're interested, reach out to us um, and you have my email, uh, you have some experienced folks that are at the panel as well, tap in with them. Um, get an insight from them, learn about, uh, you know, how they got the ball rolling uh, and then speak with us. We're more than happy to, you know, support you as you're getting the ball rolling within your community uh, and then seeing who else we can bring at the table. Okay, well, uh, one of the challenges, Phaedra and Kara, with Saanich, and I know this from personal experience, is that there is a huge reluctance for, on their part to actually implement uh, responsible pet ownership bylaw. I was working with a group of Saanich residents a couple of years ago trying to get that in place. And uh, one of their, even though staff acknowledged that it was an issue, in fact, especially because staff acknowledged it was an issue, they said that they didn't want the, the bylaw to be put in place because they didn't feel they had the resources to manage it, to, um, to do it and the comment in the chat about the uh, the dogs where Saanich actually has put a bylaw in place and they're still being told that the bylaw enforcer officers can't enforce the rules. Um, what strategies can people use to try to get the local politicians to adopt some bird friendly procedures and policies when, when obviously there's conflicts with their budgets and that sort of thing. That's a, that's a really great question, and and as you know, at the nature sanctuary, we have uh, a lot of issues with you know people with their pets off leash or you know bringing dogs to the nature sanctuary, which is not allowed because it's zoned as a conservation area. And um, and and one of the things that I see a role for is like not ceding our control over to a municipal government and thinking like oh only they manage this. I think that each of us can play a role in this by sort of reframing how we view our interactions with nature. And I think that, um, you know, as we grow our awareness as a community all together, all of us in this community, we are able to share uh, sort of commonly held values and beliefs about how we interact with nature. And so uh, for me, it's a little bit less like, oh, tell the teacher, you know, Johnny's stealing my eraser and more about like, oh, hey, we don't steal erasers in this classroom. 
you know, and so when we embody those beliefs, then I think we get really powerful change. And yeah, it takes time and it's challenging and you know difficult, but I think that's a, a worthwhile goal to, to look for. So yeah, absolutely. It'd be wonderful if the, the council changes over and there's more people that are ardently in support of of putting a little bit more behind enforcing this, but I think we can't necessarily wait around forever, right? Nature can't wait forever given what we're seeing. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to, to take a more active role. Okay, hey, uh, Mike. Sorry, I was just gonna pipe in there from, from Calgary's experience as well. Um, we do have responsible pet bylaws in the city, but it's not just, um, you know, all pet ownership does not fall solely on the city of Calgary. So they've kind of um, partnered up with, with local nonprofits to help out with some of the other things that don't fall under that bylaw. So, I mean, the Calgary Humane Society helps out with stray animals. Um, you know, the Meow Foundation took it upon themselves to start a spay neuter program for feral cats because the city just couldn't take that on. Um, you know, there's other organizations working with the city now to to do um, spaying and neutering as well and for owners, so low income spay and neuter programs. And also because of budgetary constraints, the city of Calgary did have to cancel their low income spay and neuter program, but enough people put pressure by calling the city and saying, this is a service that we need. This is something that we need in the city that they've actually just last week announced that it will be coming back. Mm -hmm. So I would say that local pressure as well, that people saying, this is something that we need in our community whether it's from the perspective of, um, you know, the wildlife safety for wildlife safety for nature, or whether it's from the perspective that, you know, these, these dogs are off leash and it's causing a safety concern for people in the community, whatever it may be, putting that pressure on city council to say, this is something, the more people that bug them about it, um, that seems to be something that in, in Calgary, at least has been effective to, to change the, the enforcement. That's Sorry. just our experience. And of course it's different there, but. <laughs> Sarah, in Calgary, you also have licensing for cats. Is that correct? That is correct. And wasn't yeah, that those... spay neuter to be largely funded um, from the license fees? That is correct. <laughs> yes. So there was, uh, yes. So there was a bit of a controversy there as they canceled that program over the last bit of like, where's the, the cat licensing fees going towards if it's not going towards the spay neuter program. And that may have also been a bit of a, bit of a push to bring it back as well but yes you are correct <laughs> see when when we were looking at trying to get such a bylaw in place in in Saanich we looked to Calgary and said look at Calgary <laughs> they're awesome oh, be wonderful <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so uh, Mike Rogers says he's been having more window strikes in the past few days probably robins gorging on the cotoni asterberries uh, does it help to keep the curtains closed in the morning when the sun is low Oh, well, everybody's let, jumping in at We once. should let Phaedra take that one. Yeah, Phaedra. She's been doing the research. <laughs> um, yeah, so the main issue with windows and why they're such an issue for birds is two factors, um, transparency and reflectivity. So the, for instance, like the treatments we're doing at the nature center, the reason they work is because they're actually on the outside of the windows. So I painted on the outside because that way, no matter like what the sun is doing, it will help block the um, reflectivity so that, you know, if they see a tree, it's, it's a reflection, they don't try to fly at it. So the thing with the curtains is that it's not really effective um, just because it's on the inside of the um, window. So anything on the outside, like even if you had like um, an insect screen on the outside, that's really helpful. You can even, if you wanna do like, um, a kind of a stop gap. You can draw on it with um, a bar of soap, as long as it's not raining, um, but you can do that um, and that will help. Cause again, it's all about just breaking up that reflectivity and transparency. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. So, so one thing Mike that I have uh, recommended to people and the feedback I've gotten has been very positive is even just putting some wrinkled saran wrap or um, you know, clear, wrap food wrap on on those windows can do that because it does break up the reflection of the birds and it still lets light come in so it's not as disruptive as some other treatments that you might try like putting up cardboard uh, so you might want to try 
something like that. It may have to be taped up. It may not st stick to your window, but uh, people have had good success with it. I've never heard that one. So that's, that's a good one to know. Thanks. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, then uh, I guess I can let you guys head off to, to bed or, or, or feed the baby, right? But, oh, uh, but thank you very much for coming and talking to us about this. We have recorded this talk and we'll make it available to others as well. So you'll get more than just the audience that is at hand at the moment. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much for having us. And if there's any questions that come up later, feel free to reach out. Take we'll care, folks. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.